It was not going to originally be the plan to record on Halloween. No. It's spooky season. Hello, happy Halloween. This will be uh, more than a week after Halloween by the time you're listening to it. But Sam thinks he's going to be all cool and fit and do fit boy things and go participate in events that last until Tuesdays. Well, no, it, it lasts from from Saturday at noon to Sunday at 1. But it's in Dallas and I'm driving there. So... Why don't you just uh, why don't you just sleep deprive yourself and get back sooner, like a like a regular person? Oh, because there's a a brunch on Monday that I'm going to. Oh, a Monday brunch. A Monday brunch. A Monday brunch. Well, good for you. Thank you. Good for you. I'll do my best. Good for you. Um. So yeah, the, 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 all of that to say, we're recording the podcast a week early. Mm-hmm. Um, will things be outdated? Almost certainly so. Uh, and as such, I want to I want to preface before we really get into the the, the whole regular spiel of things that uh, at certain points I might pop up in the in in the future timeline. The fu- future Connor. The future future Connor from podcast recording Connor might pop up and be like, "Hey, this is a meaningful update. Do a little do a little pickup, mm-hmm. if you will, on on the next Tuesday when Sam will not be in town. A little pick your nose. I will. Ooh. I'll pick my friends." And I'll pick my nose. And I'm going to pick my friend's nose. No. You don't want to do that. <laughs> I will, I will, I'll probably get a nosebleed, to be honest with you. Oh, that's hot. That's hot. Anyway, this is episode 53 of the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast, a D&D and MTG podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. And we, we are the we, Dungeon Bros. We are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. That's true. That's true. We are not in a dungeon. Someday we're going to be in a dungeon, I bet. Uh, I, what is What is a podcasting studio if not a dungeon most of the time? Usually off to a room underground. Sure. Devoid of windows. Devoid lights, of... Lights. Easily accessible exits. Mm-hmm. You know? Uh, some ghouls. Ooh. Ooh. It is the season of the ghoul. Yes. It is the season of the ghoul. You make, I, make good points. I think it's always a spooky season down in dungeons. I mean... They have to have, like, a day off, right? Maybe. Like, Skeletons get to go out and on a little... Like, little... karaoke night or something, you know? Or maybe those are like the actually scary things is when it's karaoke night because you just hear them fucking like, ah! just like off in the distance. I wanted to get away is, from the mic. Is that how you sing karaoke? Yeah. Well, oh. I mean, what what does a ghost sound like when they're singing karaoke? Uh, probably whatever they sound like singing. You would think that. I mean. You would think that. I don't know. You would think that. It's a very deep and philosophical question. That is true. But this episode 53 of the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast is sponsored by bees, uh, our favorite variety of the bees, uh, very topical for this time of year, the spooky season, the boo bees, that's scary right. bees. That's right. Just today only, Halloween. Halloween all only. All Hallows Eve. All Hallows Eve. You can just walk around and just see all of the boo bees imaginable. Yeah, go to a Halloween party. You're hanging out with your friends. Like you're you're the ketchup bottle. Your boy's the mustard bottle. You roll up. You see you see all of your friends at the party. You might see the sexy cats, the nurses, the the Frankenstein's and such. And all amongst them, the boo bees. Yes, the boo bees. Every other day of the year, they're regular bees. They are regular bees. But today they'll be boo bees. Boo bees. We here at the Dungeon Bros have been big fans of the boo bees for a very very long time. Uh, most of our, I, I think I, I I don't I don't have a specific memory of my first falling in love with the Boo Bees. I, I would probably say in the early teens, maybe preteens times when I was first really, really cognizantly aware of of the glory of mm. the Boo Bees. Indeed, you know who can really say what their first experience was with the Boo Bees. Yeah, that is true. That is true. I've encountered many a Boo Bee in my life, and mm. it's. They're, they're all a really great time. So, yeah. Uh, Thank you for... Go boo- ahead and check out their website today. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, or don't type that into... Don't type that URL in. Right. That's just... Uh, <laughs> it's bees.com slash boo. I... Sure. Thank you, boo bees, for sponsoring the podcast. <laughs> I literally think we're the only ones that find these bits funny. I don't know. I've never. I don't really talk to people who listen to our podcast besides Travis and Lincoln. Hi, Travis and Lincoln. Hello, Travis and Lincoln. Thank you for watching. Lincoln, level three MTG judge. I asked him a question today about about an interesting interaction mm-hmm. uh, that I'm not entirely. I have a PDH deck. I'm gonna. I'll get into this. I don't give a fuck. 
we can ramble. We, yeah, we don't have too many topics today. I have I have a Popper EDH deck. For those of you that don't know, a Popper EDH deck is basically a commander deck where instead of a legendary creature as your commander, it has to be a creature that was printed at the uncommon rarity at some point. Uh, and then every other card in the deck is either a basic land or a card that was printed at common at some point. Uh, so I have a, a PDH deck for third path iconoclast. It's an uncommon creature from Brothers War. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, you get a 1-1 one, one artifact soldier creature token. Uh, so I have a lot of like artifact synergies and stuff. And I have, I can't, I think it's Stern, Dis no, it's not Stern Dismissal. It's, oh, I already forgot the name of it, but it's a counter spell. Mm -hmm. It's two blue counter target spell. Uh, it has an additional cost of tapping an artifact or paying an additional generic mana. So basically, a counterspell clone with an extra step. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was asking, I, I messaged Lincoln to be like, hey, based on how you pay for the mana cost of spells, it's, it's the, the mana cost is blue blue. Yes. So do I pay blue blue, cast the spell? I have third path iconoclast out. I would, I've cast the spell. Then I have Third Path Iconoclast. Do I then get a 1-1 one, one artifact creature? And because the additional cost is in the text box, am I then able to use that artifact creature that I've created to tap for the additional uh, cost of said counter spell? So just a weird little interaction from our from our from uh, from the deck that yes. only, only level 3 Judge Lincoln is going to be able to help us with. Level 3. Level 3. How many levels of judges are there? I do not know. I mean, you can't, I mean, level, I mean, he's, I've met Lincoln, like, level three can't be that high, right? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, well, he's been playing for quite a long time. He has been playing for he's quite a He's getting quite a spot right now. He really has. He really has. Didn't he, like, place well in a tournament recently? Or no, he pulled, he, he uh, was at a tournament. He was at a tournament, did not, uh, but he pulled a uh, uh, serialized card from oh, Doctor that's Who. Right. That's right. That's right. Good for him. Good for him. Good for him. Sam, tell us about your fucked up schedule a little bit. Oh, about why wouldn't be me not being here for yeah. Monday Night Magic? Yeah, why, and... why are you why are you fucking everything up for me? Well, you're making my life infinitely more difficult. Uh, because your pain and suffering brings me joy. But that's rude and offensive. <laughs> but uh, no, this coming weekend in Dallas, Texas, is going to be the world's toughest mutter, a twenty-four hour obstacle course race, uh, and myself and two of our friends from here will be participating. Um, not me. <laughs> not you. No, no. Uh, one of our friends, maybe a little participating, a little less now that she sliced her foot open on a piece of sheet metal. Is this a new development? It happened like two days, maybe three days Is ago. Is this a friend that's getting married? Yes. Okay. I yeah. assumed, but yeah, she went ahead and sliced. Congratulations, her... by the way. Yeah, she went ahead and she sliced her. Oh god, no. she went ahead and sliced her foot open. So uh, she's like, I'm going to see if I should could or maybe shouldn't get it wet so a lot of the obstacles of course water obstacles oh my god that's a, i she's a very smart woman yes she is a she is a uh, a medical sales rep yeah uh you slice your foot open the last thing you want to do is put yourself in a trench foot situation which is basically what a tough mudder is it's oh, just yeah. it's just a lot of water a lot of run a lot of mud it's a lot it's, of not getting dry for 24 hours yeah it's literally just a boy scout trench foot simulator yeah if, if we're being completely honest with ourselves, but uh, yeah, we're gonna we have a friend who does tough mutters who is a ER surgeon or an ER doctor. I don't remember if she's a surgeon, but uh, mm -hmm. she'll be she'll be assessing our friend's foot before the race, mm. and then we'll go from there. Interesting, interesting. Well, that's good good for her. I hope I hope it, hope it gets better. Hope you can participate. Actually, hope you get to sit this one out. <laughs> Take a little rest. She goes a little bit too hard in the paint. She like she is a she's a person who fills her life with activities constantly. She does. She does. Now, completely unrelated. Okay. Completely unrelated. I recently found myself at a Michaels. A Michaels. Okay. The, sure. The craft, craft store. The craft store. The craft store. I was offended beyond belief upon entering this establishment. This was probably what October twenty seventh, twenty eighth, something like that. The other day. Mm -hmm. I walk into the Michaels. What do you think is being advertised currently in their products at the very front of the store, taking up probably a quarter of the entire volume of the of the store? What, what, what do you think they would be selling products for? Uh, one would fathom that they would be selling products for Halloween as it is today. Yeah, you would. One would think that. Mm -hmm. 
One would think that. What do you think they're selling products for? Uh, Christmas. It is absolutely Christmas products. Fucking floor-to-ceiling, wall-to-wall Christmas products for the front, like, third of the store. Okay? Halloween relegated to a mere aisle. Mm -hmm. Thanksgiving scattered about. The, the utter disrespect for Thanksgiving, I want to point out, is appalling to me. Absolutely appalling. I, personally, big fan of the giving of thanks. Do you know why? Because you get to eat food. You get to eat food, and it's a holiday that doesn't require anything of you. Halloween, you got to get a costume. You got to get the fucking candy. You got to stand at the door and be like, what are you supposed to be? When all the kids walk up and they want the fucking candy for free... And then you got to give them the candy and you got to be like, you got to be cool. You know, mm. Christmas, you got to buy a bunch of people gifts. Some people got to travel across like Thanksgiving, show up, eat some fucking food, uh, watch some football, fucking drink beer, enjoy a pie and then fuck off. Like that's all that's all you got to do for Thanksgiving. Mm. So the disrespect offends me and Christmas. Stand down, like take. Take a moment and just fucking calm down a little bit. People, people, there are Disney adults and then there are Christmas adults. And often these two overlap. Heavily. Heavily overlap. Heavily overlap. I am not particularly a big fan of Christmas. I would be a bigger fan of Christmas if it was hyped up for a, a week. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's hyped up from about, well, tomorrow's November 1st. So some people will start tomorrow. Some people have already started, which is a problem. And then some people are still celebrating when Valentine's Day is approaching. Another holiday I don't like. But I digress. The, we, we as a society need to look these corpos in the face and be like, no. No. We're not going to stand for this, okay? You can, you can have your sweatshops in China. You can have your child labor. You can break, like, Geneva Convention laws. But fucking don't sell Christmas products until after the, uh, Black Friday. Black Friday is the perfect time to start selling Christmas products and then end it by the new year. I'd like to remind the viewers that the, uh, the these views <laughs> expressed by Connor do not reflect that of the Dungeon Bros. This is my Tiananmen Square. Okay. This is the hill I'm dying on. I'm Fuck not Christmas. I'm not willing to die on this hill, but I am willing to kill you here. I will climb. That's my favorite sound from TikTok right now. I'll climb to the top of that hill. For sure. And I'm going to stay there as long as I possibly can. And I'll shout to the rooftops, stop selling Christmas products this early. This is ridiculous. All right. With that, I think we should move on to the uh, the upcoming releases for upcoming releases. Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons. We're going to start with Magic the Gathering because there's more of them. Uh, by the time this podcast is released, uh, currently not yet, but by the time this podcast is released, we're getting the second run of the Lord of the Rings, Tales of Middle-Earth. Uh, universes beyond expansion it's going to just be some scene boxes uh so there's going to be that would be what six times four 24 new cards uh we know what the cards are they're fucking powerful and mm -hmm. cool and awesome and you can get the scene boxes which are going to include six of them that are in extended art that go together in a frame and then it's a nice little lord of the rings scene it also includes three set boosters uh and then you also get collector booster packs that are new which are basically just going to be the regular set collector boosters plus the 24 cards. You can get surge foils, extended arts, all that kind of stuff. Doctor Who Commander decks are already out. Lost Caverns of Ixalan, November 17th. We are planning to get pre-release kits as we often do. Mm -hmm. We might even, because normally we just open the packs. And yes. then we enjoy the cards and we play our regular games of Commander. We might do a Monday Night Magic post pre-release weekend. Open up a pre-release kit each build a deck as you're supposed to do with pre-release kits and then play a best of three game then move on to open the rest of the packs we have and end the live hmm. i think that would be a fun little time we might we might we might we might not we'll see we we'll might see. just open the packs love the packs love a pack opening you know it's it's not advised for getting specific cards it's a little gambly but we uh it's a little more than a little gambly but we have fun it's we fun do. it's exciting we do have fun. We do have fun. Uh, also, the Lord of the Rings scene boxes. I might get a scene box uh, specifically for next Monday's live stream as of the recording of this. If you're listening to the podcast, this means nothing. But uh, when Sam is gone, 
we're not going to be able to do Monday Night Magic. So I need something to do Mm -hmm. on Monday night for the live just to keep people satiated. Indeed. You know, keep that keep that live flowing. Well, let's uh, not that I, let ooh. the leave leave. Uh, leave okay. uh, I don't know. I might I might get like a random pre-release kit. Who knows? Who knows? I don't. Ravnica remastered, <laughs> January twelfth, twenty twenty four, as well as the Fallout Commander decks, March eighth, twenty twenty four. On the last episode of the podcast, we talked about some of the Fallout pre-release car or preview cards that we've seen. <laughs> Haven't really seen anything from Ravnica remastered, but at the same time, it's going to be the original Ravnica set reprinted for the most part. Yes. So. There's that. If you like the if you like this podcast, you can find it on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, our YouTube channel as well. I'm I'm looking into taking the video from the live and then stitching it with the recording of the podcast so that the YouTube channel has a video version of the podcast. Ooh. We're in the preliminary stages of seeing if that's going to be a fairly easy workflow, which seems like it might be. Which seems like it might be. You can look forward to that. Forty thousand of you follow us on TikTok where we do our Monday night magic live streams. We play Magic the Gathering Commander. Usually two player commander. Oftentimes we'll we might we might grab some jumpstart packs. We have plans to do a uh, build a PDH deck from cards that we have night where we just bring a deck that neither of us know anything about because we pretty much know each other's decks yeah. very well at this point. Uh, show up with a PDH deck because we can just grab cards that we have, not have to buy anything. Do that. We like to do pack openings for pre-release season. Whenever a set comes out, we like to get some packs, all that kind of stuff. We also have an Instagram, a Twitter, a Discord. All that kind of stuff. Our deck, our deck lists are on Moxfield. We need to update those deck Probably lists. Probably do need to update those. Probably do need to update those deck lists. Anyway, top story. Actually, no. Upcoming releases for D&D books. We skipped over that because kind of it's also the top story. The Book of Many Things releasing digitally today, October 31st on Halloween as of the recording of this. It will have been out a week digitally by the time you're listening to this. Supposed to come out November 14th, but the physical release is delayed. Big delay. This is, this could be a good thing. This could be a bad thing. I don't know yet. But Wizards of the Coast says it has decided to postpone the physical release of the Dungeons and Dragons deck of many things for an indefinite time period. Following an internal review of samples that revealed quality issues with the manufactured products, D&D's next physical release, the Deck of Many Things, will not drop on November 14th as initially planned, according to D&D Beyond. Wizards of the Coast re- released the announcement acknowledging issues with the physical product, saying, quote, It's important to us at Wizards of the Coast that our customers are delighted with the quality of the products they receive. After an internal review, we found the product did not meet our manufacturing standards. Unfortunately, making this right will delay the release of the physical products, both directly from Wizards as well as our retail partners. The Deck of Many Things comes as a box set containing 66 tarot-sized cards and two hardbound books, The Book of Many Things, and The Card Reference Guide. Wizards of the Coast clarified that only the physical products are affected by the suspension, specifically the cards and the card reference guide. Those who purchased the physical and digital bundle of the product will still have early access to the digital version of The Book of Many Things on October 31st, today as of recording, a week ago as of the release of this podcast, ahead of the digital product's official release on november 14th the company did not mention how long the suspension will last and it's unclear if pre-orders will be fulfilled in time for the holidays another quote from the wizards of the coast team quote we believe that delaying the release of this product will ensure it is delivered to you in a way that our team envisioned it they are committed to addressing reports that the copies sent out for review included disfigured uneven and curved cards these discrepancies affect deck handling and gameplay since the cards need to need needed more break-in time to lay flat on the table. Uneven and damaged cards also made decks difficult to deal out, as shorter cards tend to fit, tend to fall in clumps when shuffling, thereby messing with the rhythm. So, Wizards of the Coast has had some issues recently of quality control in their products. Yeah. But we've mostly seen it up to this point in the contents, the the, the intellectual po- yes, the intellectual processes and properties, not necessarily the physical aspect of it. Yeah, the manufacturing has usually been pretty on point. Um, I think most manufacturing issues they deal with come in the realm of Magic: The Gathering cards, specifically yes. with the pring the the pringling of the foils, which as of recent sets have seemed to decrease drastically oh yeah even even in our time of playing match the gathering a little over a year and three months Mm -hmm. at this point um when we first got in we got a whole bunch of uh 
the Dungeons and Dragons Adventures in the Forgotten Realms and Baldur's Gate sets uh, and uh, the Commander decks at 2022 Gen Con. And we got we got many foil basic lands. Yep. And the foil basic lands from Baldur's Gate are freaking cupped beyond belief, even yeah. now. I got a, a, a bundle for Brothers War, and that comes with a pack of um, basic lands. Mm-hmm. I think it's maybe maybe two plays at two, so eight of each. Yeah. And yeah, just I didn't even t- – they were so bent that it's like I can't play these. I just ended up putting them in our uh, – sell to cool stuff inc at gen con this year pile yeah we, we yeah we we do love the uh the the just generic box of these cards we are more than happy to get rid of and just get like ten dollars in store credit for the entire box and buy a pack yeah mentality that's a great way to get rid of a lot of your bulk by the way but yeah so seeing i mean i'm glad to see that that they the wizards of the coast has has taken uh seriously this issue of a crap product Mm -hmm. especially because tarot cards are uh uh there are a lot of people who produce them these days this is true um we have a couple of friends i have a couple of friends uh you have a couple of acquaintances who are my friends who are who very much enjoy tarot cards doing the readings or just having the cards and they get you know specific sets Mm -hmm. uh Tarot cards are also different dimensions than like a normal they playing are. card or trading card as well. They're a bit bigger, They're right? They're taller, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, it, it, the, I find something funny that they mentioned here was that the when shuffling, the shorter cards tend to clump together and fall out, which is exactly how you want the cards to be for a like street artist or a street magic mm-hmm. game because you're like, pick the card. Oh, it paused a little longer. They're going to pick that. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean... We've talked about many of the issues that they've had in the content. Uh, Match of the Gathering cards are there, there's constantly there's always seems to be a constant stream of why why is the quality so inconsistent mm-hmm. in the printing in the foiling? Why why are like Pokemon's foils so fucking perfect every single time? Yeah, and then Magic it's like. Oh, Wilds of Eldrain, the foils were really good, but the Brothers War foils were fucking terrible, and some of the foils in All Will Be One were good, and then some were Pringled to death, and then, like, yeah. and then, and then, and then. It's so inconsistent, because, I mean, Magic is massive, so they have a ton of printers. Uh, I also think this really boils down to Wizards of the Coast starting to realize that they they don't have the luxury of being able to have a small fuck up anymore. Yeah, they do not. No, after after 2023, the year that they have had optically from a PR perspective, uh, if the deck of many things came out and they released it and cards were misaligned and the sizes were off and it didn't shuffle well or feel well or play well, I mean the box set's not cheap by any means. No, they like if this had happened in like 2019. People probably probably would have been like, ah, oh, they had a bad manufacturing run. Whatever. Yeah. We'll we'll get a replacement. They and then they they may or may not replace it, but I think I think this is ultimately it sucks if you wanted the, the, the deck of many things. The book seems like it's interesting. Yeah. The ideas that they were coming up with the deck of being able to use it to like make random dungeons on the fly and help with like D- uh, DM prep and that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. That's interesting. But I like, I like that they're recognizing that they can't fuck up again. Oh yeah. And they're, and they're doing their damnedest to not let that fuck up happen again. So good thing. Sorry for those of you that were excited for it. That being said, I don't think that many people were really excited for it. Uh, I like the I like that they were using reassuring words and still releasing the digital mm-hmm. um, book of many things on its on its expected release date of Halloween. Um, they they assured that people that bought the bundles and pre-orders were going to get their products. I would be very I'm sure I'm sure from a PR perspective they're like we can't guarantee that they're going to be out by Christmas. Right. But at the same time, I mean November fourteenth re- release. Think from a from a printing and um, packaging and release and distribution aspect. They made they made the call to to not do this 
what two and a half weeks before and we're probably just now hearing about it yeah um it's going to take them probably two weeks to get a sample that they like do a print run and then distribute it so that would give them until if we wanted it out by if they wanted it packages at doors by christmas eve Mm mm-hmm that would be, what, the 10th of December? I imagine that they're going to have a good sample by the end of the month for November. One would hope, but corporate uh, corporate time schedules suck. Uh, I say that, you know, dealing with somebody who works for a corporation. Mm-hmm. Um, Plus things are going to get delayed the closer they get to Christmas. Oh, yeah. Uh, soon here, shipping, uh, anything shipping will be just a, a big bundle of chaos. Big bundle of, big bundle of fluff, for sure. Um all that being said, do we have we we record this podcast live on TikTok every time we do. Do we have anyone has anything to say about the delay of the deck of many things? Does not seem to be anything about the delay of the deck of many things. All right, then we'll we'll, we'll answer more questions. We'll, we'll go through all the all the menagerie of questions at the end and answer them. Absolutely. Absolutely. But for now. Next a little, just a little wrap-up. We like to talk about set spoilers mm-hmm. as they come out. We've got the Lost Caverns of Ixalan is going to be the next Magic the Gathering set. And we are deep into the spoiler season right now. Every single day, it seems like there's new cards that are being shown by various creators online. Uh, I, I applied once for the Dungeon Bros to be yeah. one of the outlets. Which, honestly, if I look at some of the creators that are getting access to preview cards... Um, like, I've... There's one that was like, I, I got access to this preview and was like talking about it. And I'm like, cool. I clicked on their Twitter. They had like 500 followers. I clicked on their link tree. I go to their socials. It's like 2,000, 4,000, 500, yeah. 300. And it's like, bro, got 40,000 followers on TikTok. We got, a, we got a twice monthly podcast every other week talking about MTG and d and I'm not saying we're massive by any means. No. But I mean, the caliber, the caliber of certain creators that they're... That they're giving these preview cards to. I need. I need to have a word with their. I need to have a word with their team. Let's go fight Watsy. Let's fight them. Let's fight them. They'll send the Pinkertons after us. It'll be fine. But we'll fight the Pinkertons. We'll fight the Pinkertons. Uh, Lost Caverns of Ixalan. A lot of a lot of dinosaurs. Love dinosaurs. Big fan of a dinosaur. A new land type that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. But we're just gonna. We've got. We've got. Uh, MTG Goldfish is a great resource for spoiler season. Uh, they have an entire page dedicated to previews. We have the Lost Caverns of Ixalan spoilers, and they update it daily yes. with the cards that get revealed online, and you can just see the entire database of preview cards. MTGGoldfish.com. Not sponsoring the podcast, but they're fucking awesome. Great resource. Sam, do you have any any you want to point out? Um, I mean, I'm I'm. If we want to just you know start scrolling down and calling, we see. But uh, we'll, we'll start by talking about some of the mechanics that are going to be in the set specifically. Mm. Um. So there's going to be re uh, coming back up with the explore mechanic, yeah, which allows you to flip a card off the top, and if it's a land card, put it in your hand. Otherwise, put a plus one counter on the thing that lets you explore. Yes, uh, discover three is a new keyword mechanic. You exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a non-land card with mana value three or less. There's also like discover five for mana value five or less, etc. You can cast it without paying its mana cost or put it into your hand and put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So this is kind of like Cascade. It's Cascade Light. It's Cascade Light. It has a limit on the upper end of uh, mana cost. There are some with uh, X. I've seen Discover X. Mm -hmm. Where X is whatever. Whatever. But it's also nice that you aren't required to cast the card. You are able to just put the card into your hand if it's not useful to you to at cast it at the moment. Like you, so if you flip a counter spell or something. Yeah, you then have a counter spell in your hand. Uh, There's also the craft with, um, which is an interesting mechanic. Craft with says that uh, ha- it's craft with and then has a mana cost. You pay the mana cost, exile the artifact that it is on, and then you exile the other required things. Sometimes an artifact. Uh, there's one that says exile a dinosaur, a merfolk, and a vampire, and a pirate. Yeah, that card's probably not going to be very good. And uh, then you get to flip it. Yeah. Uh, when you get the backside, you get usually something that is significantly more powerful than the front side. Uh, if we look at the uh, inverted iceberg, it is a two and a blue artifact. 
Uh, when it enters the battlefield, you mill a card and then you draw a card. It also has craft with artifact costing four blue blue. So you would pay four and two blue. You would exile the inverted iceberg along with another artifact that you control or an artifact that is in your graveyard, which makes it a little bit easier to pull off than something like Meld yes. did. Uh, and then you would flip it and you would get a 6-6 six, six artifact creature golem that whenever it attacks, you can tap or untap target artifact or creature. Which for two mana is pretty good. The overall investment in mana, though, would be, what, six, eight total mana. And then you have to exile an artifact from either your battlefield or your graveyard. A little bit costly. Yeah, with these with these uh, craft with artifacts, we when the ones that we've seen so far, I haven't been too impressed with. It definitely seem, it, you know, uh, it seems like the Yu-Gi-Oh! mechanic from the anime where it's like, I have to sacrifice... My mm-hmm. uh, my dark magician and this other thing and create the black luster soldier. Um, I I use polymerization on. Yeah. It definitely feels like that. I haven't seen too many that I'm super enthralled with when it comes to the craft with mechanic. I think they're neat. Yeah. And I think like on, honestly, the one you're kind of hovering over right yeah. now is kind of the. Oh, do- Odaclan Arch is a one white mana artifact that when it enters the battlefield, you can scry two. It also has craft with artifact two and a white, so it only costs three mana. And then on the backside, you get a one four with flying that whenever it attacks a target attacking creature without flying, gains flying. So that's not too bad to set up early in the game. And then, you know, especially if you have tokens or you have other things going to your graveyard, like you don't, you you know, you crack your wayfarers bobble. Now it's in the graveyard. Okay. Now it has another use. I think that's pretty okay. I think that's in, in limited formats and draft formats. I think this works a lot better. I agree. Uh, Low mana cost things that you can just get a quick little value out of. And then you have something that you can dump mana into later. If you are flooded or if you don't have anything to cast or Mm -hmm. no cards in hand, Nothing particularly wrong with it. It's not necessarily a powerful mechanic. I think it works much better than Meld did on in something like Brothers War, where it's way too specific. Uh, we got a cool reprint art of Lightning Greaves, which looks cool. We are sure love love a reprint. Why not? I want to talk about the new land type that's coming into play here, the Cave Land type. Uh, a lot of them are printed at Common. Uh, we have something like Promising Vein. Uh, they all seem to tap for a colorless. Promising Vein, you can pay one and tap it to sacrifice it. Search your library for a basic land, put it on the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle, basically, an Evolving Wild. Or it would be more like Terramorphic Expanse. Uh, evolving Wilds, Terramorphic Expanse, pretty much do the same. It reminds me more of the Shire. Yeah, it is very similar to the Shire. But you also have something like the Forgotten Monument, which is a land cave that can tap for a colorless. Other caves you control have tap, pay one life, add one mana of any color. So becoming a t- much like uh, layers or gates where this type of land can affect other lands of the same type. Mm-hmm. The one land that I think is really going to make splashes in other formats is the Echoing Deeps. Uh, it is a common land cave. It can tap for colorless, just like the other ones. You may have Echoing Deeps enter the battlefield tapped as a copy of any land card in a graveyard, except it's a cave in addition to its other types. Being able to copy other lands in formats like Modern, where the Dark Depths combo is very popular. Dark Depths is a land that does not tap for mana. It enters with, I think, like 20 counters on it, and then you can pay into it or tap it to remove Mm -hmm. counters. And then when all of them are removed, I think there's 10. When all 10 of them are removed, you get a 2020 Flying and Destructible Merit Lage token. Uh, it has a wonderful combo with a land called Thespian Stage, where you can pay two and tap in and have it become a copy of another land that you control. When you copy a land, it's a it's the the counters being put on it are an enter the battlefield effect. Yeah. So a land that's already on the battlefield, copying it, just becomes the copy of it. And since it doesn't have counters, it immediately sacrifices itself. For one, the one with counters sacrifices itself to the legend roll, and then the copy of it sacrifices itself to its ability because it no longer has counters, and then you just, for two mana, immediately get a 2020 indestructible flying Merit Lage. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So a, a, a land like this that's going to be able to copy pieces like that, it's going to be able to copy powerful, non-basic land. It could copy... Uh, your opponent, it could copy any land card in a graveyard. So if your opponent did like a Tomb of Yawgmoth yeah. and then it was removed at some point or like a Gaia's Cradle, you can have it enter 
as a tapped version of that. And then it's also a cave, so it would it would function with any other cave synergies that you might have with your mana base. The cave lands sound really, really exciting. The problem is, this is the first time they're being printed. Yeah. So there's very limited number of cave lands that are that are available. So I would love to see some more cave lands printed in other sets with some other synergies. Uh, it also helps that they're colorless lands, so they can go in like any kind of deck. They can go in uh, like Eldrazi decks, colorless mm -hmm. decks as well. Um, we also have the other cycle of the man lands. I believe these are the enemy color cycle. Uh, so Restless Reef, for example, turns into a pay for a two blue black and turn it into a four four shark with death touch. Uh, and whenever it attacks, target player mills four cards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we we get the exciting version of that. Oh, where are they? Where are they? Oh my gosh! Scroll all the way down. Here we go. I'm personally, in terms of the man land cycle, we gotta we gotta shout out the restless prairie. Yes. It's this. It's the. Um, Simic. Or no, Selesnia. No, Selesnia. There we go. Restless prairie, prairie becomes a three three green and white llama. We turn it into a llama. And whenever it attacks creatures you control, get plus one, plus one till end of turn. So you can have a 4-4 four, four llama kicking people in the face. This is true. Or this is spitting. I'm not sure. It's other creatures, so it, oh. wouldn't, it wouldn't. But you turned me into a llama. What? No, I did. Yes, and then you kidnapped me. <laughs> Why would I kidnap a llama? I don't know. You're the evil mastermind. Not me. That's such a good movie. They need to make that live. If they're going to make live action things, they might as well do that. But uh, Kellen, Daring Traveler, Legendary Human Fairy Scout. We get the adventure mechanic back. Yeah. Uh, Kellen, I believe, is a character that comes from Eldraine. Yeah, he we, was red. red. Yes. Red commander there. Yes, and we just had the Wilds of Eldraine set, so it's a nice little thematic thing to get uh, an adventure mechanic attached to a character that has traveled planes to mm -hmm. now the, the plane of Ixalan. The adventure half being journey on a single green mana for a sorcery. Create X map tokens where X is one plus the number of opponents who control an artifact. Then you can exile that card and then you can cast Kellen Daring Traveler. A one and white human fairy scout that is a two three. Uh, whenever it attacks reveal the top card of your library. If it's a creature card with mana value three or less put it into your hand otherwise... You may put it into your graveyard instead. The map tokens is an interesting. Is that a new? Is yeah. that a new token? Type? It's a new new token artifact type. Oh my gosh! All right, we gotta pull that up now. The map token. It's a predefined token. What does it do? What does it do? Pay one and tap, sacrifice this artifact, target creature you control, explores. Activate only as a sorcery. Exploring, you reveal the top card of your library. You put that card into your hand if it's a land. Otherwise, put a plus one, plus one counter on that creature. Then put the card back or put it into your graveyard. I like exploring. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. Maps, probably going to be useful. Oh yeah. Also, it's another tchotchke. I love my tchotchkes. They're my tchotchke decks because there aren't there aren't enough artifact token based decks yet at all. Uh, there's a series. <laughs> there's a series of artifacts as well that are able to transform. Uh, usually, when you have counters on them, you remove the counters and they flip to a legendary land that is a cave type land. Uh, for example, here we have the Brass's Tunnel Grinder. It's two and a red for a legendary artifact. When it enters the battlefield, discard any number of cards, then draw that many cards plus one. At the beginning of your end step, if you descended this turn, put a boar counter. Oh my god, what does that even mean? These these Magic the Gathering cards, man. The descend uh, reminder text at the bottom. Yeah. Descend. You descended if a permanent card was put into your graveyard from anywhere. Which is an interesting thing that they they decided to keyword there. I guess I don't know. They could have just said that. They've definitely seemed to to keyword a couple more things in this set that I don't think they've need necessarily wanted needed to in the past. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, put a if you descended this turn, you put a boar counter on the brass's tunnel grinder, and if there are three or more boar counters on it, you remove those counters and then you transform it, and then you would get. Uh, Tekultlan, the Searing Rift. It's a legendary land cave that can tap for a red mana. Whenever you cast a permanent spell using mana produced by Tekultlan, 
Jeez. Discover X where X is the spell's mana value. So you get the free casting off the top of your deck, mm -hmm. effectively. Um, I love the thematic. There's a couple of these legendary artifacts that are like drills or tunnels because the whole idea of the Lost Caverns of Ixalan is that the plane of Ixalan has all of these vast caverns beneath the ground. So you have all these legendary artifacts that are drilling into the ground, opening up these caverns, and then they flip to be legendary lands based on parts of the caverns that they're drilling into. Oh, yeah. I think that's a really, really, really cool mechanic. Uh, the last thing that... Oh, actually, no, there's several things. So, <laughs> um, oh, God. Okay, there's even more things. Here we go. We're getting a reprint of Cavern of Souls. Yeah. Not a cave land. Oh, well, it's a cavern. But you choose a creature type uh, when it enters the battlefield. It can tap for a colorless. It can also tap for one mana of any color. You can spend it only to cast a creature spell of the chosen type. And that spell can't be countered. A CEDH staple. It's being reprinted at Mythic Rare. So it's not going to be very, it's not going to really affect the price of anything. It's a $35 card right now. And in, that one is getting several treatments. I believe there's going to be oh, seven yeah. treatments overall. The normal art as well as six different neon arts. Yeah. Uh, we're getting a dinosaur dragon, apparently, with Bone Horde Dracosaur. I don't want to talk about that. Uh, well, I do want to talk about the god cards. Yes, there's a new god cycle, monocolored Ixalan gods. Yeah, and uh, some of them kind of suck. <laughs> like, you were you were pointing out before the podcast, <sighs> these names, Aklazots, Deepest Betrayal, Three Black Black, for a legendary creature, Bat God. It's a 4-4 with flying and lifelink. When it attacks, each opponent discards a card. For each opponent who can't, you draw a card. Whenever an opponent discards a land card, put a 1-1 black bat creature token with flying. You create a 1-1 bat, bat black creature token with flying. Whenever it dies, return to the battlefield tapped and transformed under its owner's control. We love that. We love a commander card that can flip when it dies instead yeah. of going back to the command zone. I'm a big fan of Edgar the Charmed Groom, even though he doesn't do a whole lot. But on the back side, you get Temple of the Dead, a land that taps for black mana. You can also pay two in black to tap and transform Temple of the Dead. Activate only if a player has one or fewer cards in hand and only as a sorcery. So this entire play style is going to be forcing your opponents to discard cards. Yeah, and I mean, you do get to, uh, you know... There are definitely play uh, play patterns where you're just going to be drawing a lot because you're going to be like, all right, there are so many cards that are in black that are we'll pay one, target opponent, every opponent, discards a card. This thing dies, target opponent, every opponent, discards a card. Braids. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to go very well in braids or braids is going to go very well in it, which you might look at that card and think, wow, that's an interesting little play style. And then we're going to scroll down to the white god here. Uh, Audra Tak, Deepest Foundation, for White White is Legendary Creature God. It's a 6-6 six, six with Vigilance. If one or more creature tokens will be created under your control, three times that many of those tokens are created instead. When it dies, it re <laughs> returns to the battlefield transformed. On its backside, Temple of Civilization taps for a white, pay two and a white tap to transform it back. Activate only if you attack to three or more creatures this turn and only as a sorcery. So... So we've seen plenty of token doublers. Obviously, any of the any of the the, the green ones of doubling season, parallel lives, the white one of anointed procession, Mondrak, glory dominus. Mm -hmm. I don't think we've seen a tripler yet. No. So we have a token tripler that, when it dies, it just becomes a land instead. So you have to exile it if you want to get it gone, mm -hmm. gone, 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 and then it can flip back to its token tripling side for three mana and only if you attack with three creatures, which if you're tripling your fucking tokens, you only have to do that once to have three token creatures that yeah. you can attack with. And you're probably going to have a lot of one ones, so it's like, oh no. Three oh ones. no. I have to attack with my one one soldiers? Oh man, that's awful. I don't want to do that. Uh, the only other god that I want to point out is Osier Anexil, Deepest Might, is two red red legendary creature god, 4-4 four, four with trample. If a red source you control would deal an amount of non-combat damage less than his power to an opponent, that source deals damage equal to his power instead. That is a four power creature. I want to point out all of the one mana red spells mm -hmm. that deal one damage. I also want to point out the one mana red spells that deal one damage 
to everything. End the festivities for one mana is a card from I believe it was Crimson Vow. Yes, is common. I believe so. It's like a thirty cent card that you pay one red mana. It's a sorcery. It deals one damage to every creature and every opponent. That is now a one mana spell that deals four damage or more if you're managing to buff up your your new god commander. Which again, you're in red. There's plenty of ways to do it. It's playing with one drop cards that say plus two plus oh target creature. Yeah, yeah. Um, so now, now your your one mana deal ping everything for one is now board wipe that also deals four damage to all your opponents. So there's so much mono red burn commander support. Oh, in the past couple sets, it's even it's been it's been ramping out. It's fine. Solfim, Mayhem, Dominus, uh, Perforos, God of the Forge got reprinted in Commander That's Masters. Right. Im, uh, Imodane, the Pyro Hammer yep. from the last from Il, uh, Wilds of Eldraine. Wilds of Eldraine. Yep. I think this one is my favorite one. This one is fun. It, it's also nice that uh, if it dies, it just becomes a land. Uh, to transform it back, you have to pay two and a red tap. Uh, you transform it. You activate only if a red source you control deals f- dealt four or more non-combat damage this turn and only as a sorcery. Uh, yeah. It's multiple sources, so it doesn't have to be one. So all you have to do is use all of the non-combat damaging spells you have to deal at least four damage. Not hard to do. And then you can pay three and you get them back. Yeah. I like that one a lot. That one's fun. I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan. You've been wanting to build a, a, a mono red burn deck here for I've, hot sec. Well, here's the thing is I do, but I'm not trying to make a big deal about it because I've just been happening into a lot of these cards. <laughs> and I feel like if I start to make it a thing, I'm not going to happen into that. Like I pulled like two Sulfa Mayhem Dominuses. Yeah. One of them was the pre-release foil version. Uh, I pulled a Perforous God of the Forge when we were cracking yeah. Commander Masters cards. I've got so many red burn spell. Like I've just I've just been collecting them. I'm keeping them in a box, a little box all together, put them together, just kind of slide them off to the side. I'm not worried about it. Cuz when we get some pre-release gifts for Lost Caverns of Ixalan, if I get Ogre and Oxel, we might just have to make it happen. Maybe. That might be the one that makes me do the thing. Do the thing. Yeah. I also want to shout out Galta. Yeah, Gal- uh, Galta. Well, the Galta Stampede Tyrant is a five green, green, green with legendary elder dinosaur, 12, 12 with trample. When Galta Stampede Tyrant enters the battlefield, put any number of creature cards from your hand onto the battlefield. I see a, I see a play style here that I like very much. Mono green stompy. Sure. We're all a big fan of a stompy green deck. Unless sure. you're on the other side of it. Okay. <laughs> Eight mana. Not crazy. That's no. expensive for a commander, but it's a 12 12 with trample. An 8 mana 12 12 with trample is nothing to sneeze at, if we're being completely honest with ourselves. Especially in green, where you can ramp out your mind, you've got mana rocks, you've got land ramp out the wazoo. You could very easily get up to 8 mana by like turn 4. Yeah. If you want. And if you're spending all of your mana to ramp, your hand is probably filling up with a fair number of creatures as well that you haven't yet been able to cast. Creatures that might also cost an exorbitant amount of mana. And might also. Like, imagine imagine a reality here. Imagine a reality here. For, just for a moment. Just for a moment. You may, you've you been ramping for like three, four turns. Okay? Mm-hmm. You've got eight mana on the field right now. You slap down your commander. Galta Stampede Tyrant. Nobody counters it. It enters the battlefield successfully. You then, from your hand for free, you slap down your Crater Hoof Behemoth, you, you slap down any of your other ridiculously powerful thing. I believe Crater Hoof gives things haste. Uh, I can't tell you off the top of my head, because I'm yeah. not that smart. I'm not a Crater Hoof player. Yeah, uh, that card's expensive. I don't think we play it gives End Race it, it gives Forerunners. Them, yeah, but yeah, End Race Forerunners. The, the End Race Forerunners is the common man's Crater Hoof Behemoth, and we fucking stand that card oh, hardcore. Yeah. Oh, hardcore yeah. fan of the end race forerunners but i'll leave that to your imagination now friends uh, anyway a couple last things of course we have the uh if you scroll up a little bit we have the um jurassic park cards that oh, are going to yes, be released yes, yes. of course owen grady raptor trainer pa- uh, partner with blue loyal raptor you can tap owen it's uh, owen of course is chris pratt uh you can tap him to put a menace trample reach or haste counter on target dinosaur, probably blue. And then blue says that for each kind of counter on him, each other dinosaur you control enters the battlefield with that kind of counter. 
That's fun. So these partner with cards. They partner with each other, which would give you access to red, green, and blue. Sam, could you go find that card? That little the little divider card that has all the color names listed out? Oh yes. We found this the other day. We always we can never remember the names of the the three color combinations. Uh, like what guilds they are. So what's red, green, and blue? Red, green, blue is Teamer. Temo- Temer. Temer? Teamer. Teamer. T-E-M-U-R. Teamer. Teamer. So you've got your Teamer deck there, I guess. Uh, you also got Hunting Velociraptor. Yeah, this one's r- also super cool. Two and a red for a 3-2 first striking dinosaur creature. Dinosaur spells you cast have Prowl, two and a red. For those of you that don't know, Prowl is you may cast a spell for its Prowl cost. If you dealt combat damage to a player this turn with a creature with any of the creature types. So, now all of your dinosaurs, you have access to green. Yep. So you've got big old dinosaurs. For example, Galt- Galta and Gishath, Sun's Avatar. Gith- Gishath wouldn't work because it's not in the color identity. But yeah, you have Galta. It's red. It's red, but you... But you'd have that in the Gishath deck. It's a oh, that's yeah. a dinosaur. That's yeah. just a that's around right yeah, yeah. creature. I was thinking in the Owen Grady. Oh, blue I'm oil. thinking just in, well. Go, uh, so Gishath is of course the the stand the the classic dinosaur commander. Yeah, as it's getting a reprint in the set. Um, but yeah, so you put this three drop thing down. You dealed combat damage to it, that, and Gishath now has a prowl of cost of two and two red. red. Galta Stampede Tyrant. Two and a red. Two and a red. <laughs> but on, but Sam, 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 hmm. it's only if you dealt combat damage to a player that, with a dinosaur in your dinosaur deck. Oh, no. How am I ever going to find a dinosaur with trample or or menace or or haste? Oh, wait. Look. Uh, look at Owen Grady. Oh, Owen Grady. Yeah. Look at that. It, it, he has the ability to give those things to blue, and then blue can give them to everything that enters the battlefield. Wow. Hmm. Hmm. Menace, trample, reach, haste. Yeah, I don't know of any dinosaurs that have trample. Not a single one. When are you going to find one of those? I don't know. Lastly? Last thing. Last thing. I want to shout out Quintorius Khan, the newest planeswalker. Quintorius. It was hinted that he was going to be a planeswalker after March of the Machines. But we have him here now in the Lost Caverns of Ixalan. It is three red, white for a four loyalty planeswalker. Quintorius. Uh, it is a static ability. Whenever you cast a spell from exile, Quintorius deals two damage to each opponent, and you gain two life. It's a plus one loyalty ability for create a three two red and white spirit creature token. Not bad at all. No, I love I love when the plus abilities are like here's a thing that you can use to defend the planeswalker. Oh yeah, big fan of that. Minus three, discover four. That's uh that's the cascade for a, a mana value of four or less, effectively. Or you can put it into your hand if you don't want to cast it. It also has a minus six. Exile any car, any number of target cards from your graveyard. Add a red mana for each card exiled. This way you can play those cards this turn. I do want to point out what Discover 4 is doing, and Cascade even. You are exiling these cards, and then you cast them for free from exile. Mm-hmm. So whenever you cast them from exile, you deal two damage to everyone. And gain two life. And gain two life. Red also has a wonderful card called Thrill of Possibilities. Yeah. And a lot of cards that are very similar to that, where you exile the top two cards of your library, and until the end of your next turn, you can cast those cards. So, card advantage in the form of exiling things from the top of your deck and then casting them from exile. Uh, Quintorius Cond is going to have, is going to be a pretty neat little Oathbreaker, I think. Pretty neat little Oathbreaker design there. Yeah. Just a lot of card advantage... Uh, a lot of a lot of ways to cast things from exile, and then just getting value, extra value for casting them from exile by healing yourself and then damaging everyone else and Indeed. draining them. Big fan. Big fan. Unless you have anything else. Oh, I. How could we forget the artifact that we need to talk about? The big boy. Millennium calendar. Yeah. You just yeah, it's right near Quintorius. Yeah. Oh, Chimmel the Inner Sun. That's the one. Oh, that's the one you want. Yeah. Uh, this this legendary artifact. Chimil, the Inner Sun. It is a six-mana legendary artifact. Spells you control cannot be countered. At the beginning of your end step, discover five. This is going to be one of those one of those cards that is just going to kind of work in everything. Yeah. In a way. A six-mana artifact is a lot of mana to put into an artifact, but it makes sure that you can get off all your spells. So all your big dinosaur stompy decks are going to really want this. 
uh, discover five at, at your end step. You get a free cast or draw of a of a spell of mana value five or less from the top of your deck every single time. Yep. Quintorius is going to love this because it exiles them, and then you can cast it for free. Yeah. <laughs> all of all of your higher mana mana cost decks, your dinosaur decks are going to love this because there's a lot of five, there's a lot of good dinosaurs that are four or five mana. There's a lot of there's a lot of good dinosaurs that are more than that as well. Yeah. None of them can be countered anymore. Just want to point that out. It's going to be an expensive card, and it's probably going to show up in a lot of things because it fits in a lot of things, much like the One Ring. Yeah, that's fair. So that's all we've got for the news today. We kind of rambled on a little bit more for the the spoiler cards than we normally would. We're about an hour on the record, a little bit less than an hour. The podcast might be going a little bit longer than that when you're listening to it on podcast feeds around the globe, because I might have uh, popped in to say a little bit more if something crazy happens or if there's an update on the uh, delay of the deck of many things in the next week, since we're recording this a week early. Mm-hmm. I don't know how you could get this far into the podcast and not know that. We've mentioned it like four times. So much. It's I like know. the only thing we've talked yeah. about. But this podcast, the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast, a D&D and MTG podcast, is available, of course, on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music. It's on our YouTube channel as well. You can follow the Dungeon Bros, which is us, myself, Connor, and Sam. We are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers, nor are we in a dungeon. You follow us on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Discord. We've got our Monday Night Magic live streams. We've got our Moxfield Decklist 4 said live streams that we stream live on TikTok every Monday night, playing two-player Commander. And we like to end... The Duels and Mana Dorks podcast every week, as we always do, by taking questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas from the TikTok live chat as we record the podcast live on TikTok on Tuesdays, the day before the podcast goes live, except this week where it's a week and a day before the podcast because Sam is making my life difficult. Yep. All right. So Crystal Ball Sparkle Black Cat asks, think you could fight two bald eagles? Bald eagle. Mm. Bald eagle. (sighs) That's tough. That's tough. The claws and the beak. Like, are the, uh, the the question is, how well are they coordinating? Don't it, know. It's difficult. The, when, when fighting the bald eagle, it's going to be difficult because they have the ability of flight. They do. The, pro, the, the, the benefit of that is they don't have any ranged capabilities. They got to get in close. If they I want to deal damage to you. They could, like, airstrike you with a turtle. That's, I'm not worried about that. You ever seen that? Well, that's how they hunt turtles. They fly down, they grab the turtle, and then they just go up and then drop it and throw it at a rock to crack it open so they can eat the juicy insides of the turtle. Yeah, I'm not worried. I can move out of the way of a turtle that's coming down at me. So Unless the other one's like right in front of you and like, oh, fuck, and then the one clocks in the back of the head, and then congratulations, that, you don't that, think anymore. That is ultimately the question that we are, we are trying to establish is how well they're coordinating. If one of them is getting in my face, I... F- hmm... Because the the talons and Talon, the beak yes. on the on those motherfuckers very dangerous. Yes. If one of them one of them's got if one of them's coming down for a physical assault on you, I'm worried about it going for the eyes. See, once once the eyes are gone, I'm done. If it shreds up an arm, I I feel like I might be because if I can get a hand on its head, I feel like I can crack a neck. You mm-hmm. know, and then one down, one to go. Maybe the other one flees in fear after seeing its friend's uh, vertebrae shattered in the grasp of a human, you know? Interesting. I've uh, I've actually uh, lived at a place where I lived at a raptor center for uh, two summers, which... Interesting. Um, and there was a bald eagle there. His name was Solo. He only had one wing. Oh, what a guy. Uh, still, still when the raptor center uh, person... Was going in to either clean Solo's cage or anything, you know, give him a checkup. Uh, she would call somebody and be like, hey, I'm going into the eagle cage. If you don't hear from me in 45 minutes, call 911. Because eagles are ridiculously powerful birds. Yeah, I don't want to fight one. No, I don't want to fight two. I, I don't, I don't want to fight one. I don't want to fight any. <laughs> yeah, no. Do I think I in a life or death situation... Could I hold my own enough to survive? Maybe. A lot of dodge rolling. A lot of dodge roll. A lot of a lot of uh, Legend of Zelda style. Hip, hip, <laughs> hip, hip. All right. Just rolling. Mark Lewis asks, "What's your favorite commander deck, and what mechanic would you love to see come up?" Hmm. Currently, of the decks that I've built, my favorite is by and far, Narset, the Enlightened Exile. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is a Jeskai commander. 
she has prowess. She gives all of my other creatures prowess. Whenever she attacks, I get to cast a non-creature spell uh, from exile. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can take a, a non-creature spell from anybody's graveyard, put it into exile, cast it for exile for free, as long as its mana value is equal to or less than her power, which she has prowess. So when I'm casting my own non-creature spells, her power is going up. So I can cast big things from not only my graveyard, but from everybody's graveyard on the battlefield. Uh, also, giving things prowess. It's a wonderful mechanic, particularly in a deck where a lot of the creatures already natively have prowess, which means they have prowess prowess. So they get plus two, plus two every time I cast a non-creature spell. I know that that's how that works because there's literally cards printed with prowess prowess. Yes. So it triggers separately multiple times, which is awesome. Big fan of that deck. Um... I, I, well, I would, I would say historically, I've said uh, Brutaclad is my favorite deck. It is a very unique commander who, uh, at the beginning of combat, you create a 2-1 mirror, and then you choose a, a token you control, and then every other creature you control becomes a token, or every other token you control becomes a copy of that token. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I like that one a lot because it is a very unique commander. It's not necessarily my most powerful commander, and oftentimes it can be, you know, a little, uh, little janky to, <laughs> to get the setup going, but it's yeah. a fun commander. Slimefoot and Squee for you, I think, is the... Probably my most powerful. Yeah. It yeah. is, yeah, my Graveyard Recursion uh, Jund deck. Mm -hmm. um, mechanics that I'd like to see come up. I would love to see some more Mutate cards uh, come back. Yeah. Because I do have a lot of Mutate in my Ivy Gleeful Spell Thief deck, and they're kind of mid most of them are kind of mid but they really help with the strategy so i'd like to see some more useful ones come up for that deck yeah some simic i'm also i'm obviously a big fan of prowess uh i'm a big fan of do a thing create a token it's not a keyword ability but do a thing make a token mm -hmm. cast a non-creature spell you get a token yeah in in the monastery mentor cast a spell you get a one one prowessy monk uh third path iconoclast you cast a spell you get a one one artifact creature Big fan of big fan of simple, repeatable token generation. Mm. All right, Aaron Johnson, who got the number one gifter badge? Hey, thank you. Uh, asks, how can I help my sister in law gain interest in her player character? Recently started playing on ROTFM. Not sure what that is, uh, and I can tell she's bored with her character which is causing the whole campaign to crash because her husband is the DM. Mm. How can I? divination wizard uh and help her get into the oath of glory paladin interesting so why what is the thing about D, &D that interests her because you're not going to get her into her character being like look at all these cool abilities you have if she doesn't give a shit about combat mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to get her invested in the story if all she wants to do is fucking slice up a goblin if you want someone to be more invested in their character, I think if she's interested in like the character aspect of it and the storytelling aspect of it, or just she seems like she's doing it for her husband. Yeah, sometimes you just can't. There's no way to force somebody to be into the hobby, you know, even if they're participating in it, somebody to be overly interested if they're just there for to support somebody else. Absolutely. And nor should you. You shouldn't force anyone to do something just because you want them to do it. Mm -hmm. If she's going to insist on being a part of this thing and she wants help of figuring out how to get more into it, uh, if, if you want her invested in her character, there's a million and one, like, a hundred questions websites mm. that are, like, tell us about yourself or learn about yourself and then just have her do that from the perspective of her character. There's also D and D specific ones mm -hmm. and have her go through her character. You could have, uh, you could pull up the, the explorer's guide to wild mount, the heroic chronicles. There's a bunch of tables in there of things like, uh, uh, cuisine for the various regions of wild mount. You could literally just pull those tables and be like, which one is your character's favorite food and why, mm -hmm. which one is your character? Like, what are your character's pet peeves? Like, if you're if they're going to a tavern, what is their go-to drink? What's a drink that they're never going to drink? Why? That kind of stuff of just making the character more real. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be so fancy as like, all right, what ha what what was your relationship with your parents growing up, and why? Like, oh, they die, or you're trying to achieve glory. Like, what? That kind of stuff's high level. I find that like 
the lower level things are what really make people like invested. Um, I feel like in uh, our friend Darren, when he was running that, that mm-hmm. game with us and his friends, where I really started to vibe with my character as well as another character at the table, was when we decided that our entire personality was, uh, when we were together, was we need to get breakfast sandwiches. And we need to find a place that can get breakfast bagels, and we need to acquire this magic item that will season food so that it's always good, and we need to make sure that we're probably preparing rations so that we have access to our breakfast sandwiches because we are obsessed with the bacon, egg, and cheese. That was really funny and fun. (laughs) All right. Do you have anything? No, oh, okay. If she's into combat, just be like, look at all these cool fucking things, and then tell the DM, and then just be like, here's a bunch of fucking things that you can kill. Oh, I know what I wanted to say. You don't have to... I, I, I think also uh, he's, he said, uh, how can I divination wizard this? Um, don't. Don't. Just talk to her outside the game. Yeah. And, you know, be casual about it. Don't be like, hey, why aren't you enjoying the game? Just, hey, you... Uh, you seem What's like, up? Yeah, you seem like you're not super into this. Is there something that we can do that would make you more into this? Yeah. Do you want some ideas? Do you want help? If she doesn't, if she just wants to be there to support her husband and we'll just go through the motions, then I mean, like, you can't really make her. Nope. People who don't want to be helped won't be helped. All right. Let's see. Who's Harris via Ralgon? How would you... Um, I, I assume there's a word missing here. How would you get someone into D and D, and why did you start with that point? Hmm. Interesting. How would you How would you get someone into D and D, and why would you? I, I'm assuming why would you Why would you choose this method for some getting somebody into D and D? So we've done. Both of us have done. Um. One shots with people who. Uh, had not played D&D, but it showed some interest. Uh, that's probably the big thing is start with people who are showing interest. Um, but the way we did it was one of us was a DM, the other was a player character, and then we had the the new person come in, walk them through character creation, doing it side by side, uh, and then ran a short little adventure, maybe two, three hours at most. And the idea was just to you know give them a chance to see like, oh, this is what... A role play encounter would be like this is what a skills encounter would be like this is what a combat encounter would be like um and make it a tight a tight you know hour one shot half, hour and a half two hours it's very easy to do when you only have one or two players yep um for me i i ran a uh a small scenario which i had run already in a D game i just took that out of that D game and put it in in front of uh connor and one of our friends um it's nice having someone that knows how D&D works because if you just sit down with one person who's never played D&D and you're like, all right, do the D&D things, they're mm-hmm. going to be like, uh, what? So having someone there who can help kind of like, oh, well, let's go to the tavern and let's see what, let's see what's going on. Yep. You know, oh, you introduced, and be like, okay, so what the fuck? Like, oh, Sam, Sam, we sit down and we're in a tavern and you're like, you're describing this like moody character in the corner. I might lean over and be like, Hey, what the fuck's up with that guy? Why is he being so weird? Yeah. You know? And then be like, Oh, we'll try to get them to the like, Oh, we should go see what's up with that guy and then go talk to him. And then, Oh, you get your quest. Cause there's some people that have, have never played D and D that also might not really be into like video games and might not understand the idea of a quest giver. Yeah. You know? That's something that a lot of people will take advantage or take uh, for granted. There yes. we go. Not take for granted. It's not a rock. Yeah, right. You're not taking rocks. Could take rocks. Could take rocks. You could kick rocks. How about that? Go kick rocks. Go kick rocks. Uh, but we take for granted some of the very basic elements of gameplay, not even tabletop gameplay, mm-hmm. just gaming in general of the quest giver of armor protection health yeah the idea of hit points for a lot of people is very foreign oh yeah like if someone if someone played like super mario brothers they've they played it forever ago when it was out on the nes and now they're an adult and they haven't been playing games it's like uh what is a what is hp yeah 
what is like like that's the kind of level that some people are going to be at if they already get a lot of gaming stuff you can kind of gloss over a lot of that but yeah one like a, a one dm two player is a great way to get someone in um pre a pre-written just dungeon mm-hmm. uh you can for example this is going to sound really stupid are they into rick and morty get the rick and morty dungeon where you can pretend to be rick as the dm and then you can hand them a pre-made character sheet and they can pretend to be that character that they already know that they're already familiar with and then you just run through a silly dungeon mm-hmm. you know you don't have to bog down the details of storytelling of figure it's like no just go to a room kill the things look around kill the things look around go to a room kill the things look around find the big thing kill the big thing get the big thing leave Sometimes it's as simple as that. Yep. And then they're like, oh, I'm into the combat aspect of it. And it's like, okay, well, let's try this, where we're going to make your own character instead of something pre-made. Or character creation is probably the biggest barrier. Oh, yeah. For sure. Yeah, the very the very first startup of, like... Yeah, front-loading a lot of the work yep. for D&D, sadly. But it's a couple ideas. We would choose those methods because most of the work of D&D is front loaded so asking someone to do all this work and then try something that they're not that they might not necessarily be into is a lot to ask of yes. someone yes it's great why uh, it's it's great when you say i'm i you know i'm into D&D or i play D&D or whatever and somebody else comes up to you and says oh that's cool i want to try and that's much easier to get them in than it is somebody who's like you're like huh. hey you know and and as relating to our last story and i think in in relating to our lives there have been times where it's like hey this person that i'm in a relationship with Mm -hmm. or is in a relationship with would you like to can you try to get into this you know either for me or because whatever yeah because you want to do the things that you want to do the things that your partner is into which is totally reasonable and then you show up and you don't really pay attention you don't really want to learn how to play you know it's a whole thing it's a whole thing um, our money, who I believe was in the maybe in the chat last night, says, "Are y'all gonna play any pre-release events for uh, Ixalan?" We don't use. We have not gone to a local game store pre-release event. Mm-hmm. We've we've been asked to multiple times by by individuals. Uh, one of one of the friends of the Dungeon Bros, Brandon Vol, he's the moderator of our uh, Monday Night Magic live streams. He's one of the real ones. Uh, he lives relatively close to us, yeah. and. We could totally drive up to his local game store and do uh, Friday Night Magic, do a pre-release weekend event. Uh, we're both exceptionally busy individuals. Yep. I work two jobs and this. Sam works a job and this. And, and hobbies. And runs. And runs, yeah. And has to travel like a half hour to go play D&D. And then... Oh, no, it's an hour. It's no. over an hour. There you go. All right. Um, Sim Drift garage says vampire decks are the best love a vampire deck i have one it's a rule zero partner commander with edgar the charmed groom and olivia the crimson bride the two, the versions of edgar and olivia from uh innistrad's crimson vow set do they synergize well no their abilities kind of don't work together but vampires thematic as shit and vampires and mardu all right danny guay guayo asks why are Vikings more rare in our American D and D, and and they should make it a thing here because of Thor? Every time I go to a D and D shop and ask for uh, ask for Norse or Viking stuff, they look at each other and laugh. They are technically barbarians, and then a, the screaming emoji. Mm. So uh, there is there is a lack of of Nordic. Yeah. D&D related things. Uh, we wow, over a year ago now, we must have talked about a third party that came out with uh, a Nordic um, uh, supplement. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we could go back in our in our in our backlogs and find that, but um, yeah, there's a, there's a lack of Nordic things. We in, we Nordic definitely tradition in D&D. Obvious, obviously, the the European Middle Earth, like medieval style thing, is is very the well, British, very well trod land. Uh, you if, even even like the the Greco Roman mm. style, you have something like the Mythic Odysseys of Theros, 
uh, Theros. Theros. I, don't, I never know how to proper. I pronounce it Theros because I do too. Yeah, I've heard it. I've heard it on official things a couple of times called Theros, and I'm like, I don't like that at all. Uh, I'm more of a Greek Roman guy than I am a Nordic Viking guy, but that does seem like an interesting blind spot a little bit mm-hmm. uh isn't there isn't there a, a magic the gathering plane that's very nordic call time call time i i could totally see them doing a call time supplement yeah it's interesting we haven't seen a lot of uh we i mean we saw for a hot second quite a few D and mtg crossovers because yep. they're obviously both owned by blizzards of the coast we got theros and strixhaven and ravnica in mm-hmm. D. we got the two we got Baldur's gate and the forgotten realms in uh, MTG, but yeah, we haven't seen a call time. That'd probably be a very, very flavorful one. Yeah, call time would be great. Uh, I think that I think they wouldn't. They maybe chose not to because of the overlap in setting themes and style that it would have to something like Icewind Dale. True. Um, it would probably be why they haven't done that. But yeah, there isn't. I don't know of any good, like Nordic supplements. I feel like at one, I, everyone always talks about all of the fucking. Um, like third party tabletop RPGs, like a Fallout one mm-hmm. and Skyrim, like all that kind of shit. Like, is there like a God of War, like modern God of War, God of War Ragnarok style TTRPG? I don't know. I don't know. Cause that's, I feel like that's a great place, like taking God of War themes and doing that kind of stuff. In terms of like building a character, I don't know. I don't know. Just fucking build a character and just be like, oh yeah, we look I'm- Nordic and do nordicy things <laughs> and of course if that's a if that's a space <clears throat> that you are will uh, you are wanting to investigate and uh you also have interest or or willingness to write some stuff go for it like that's a that's that's always a thing that's a thing that's in, supposed to be encouraged in D D is making your own kind of stuff that is true that's home true. brewing um and obviously they don't need to be uh, you know they are. They it says they are technically barbarians. Yes, by the I believe the, the um, the Roman word bar, barbarian or related means bearded one, which refer to the Norsemen who have beards as opposed to the clean shaven Romans. Mm-hmm. But I mean that doesn't need to be tied to the barbarian class in D and D. That's true. That's true. I mean anyone can be bearded. We're bearded. The bearded DM. That's true. He's beard. He's bearded. Cool guy. Yeah. Hung out with him at Gen Con. Yeah, he's a cool dude. Cool dude. Anyway. Anything think, else? No, nope, I think that's about all the time we have. All right. We're about an hour 15 on this record. The podcast might be longer if uh, anything interesting happens and I need to record a pickup. But yeah, that's that's about it. Do you have, do you have anything, any closing comments you've got, Sam? Um, no. Don't be a dickhead. Well, don't. Well, uh, I think that should go without saying. Yeah. That's fair. Uh, build de- build a deck, buy some cards, do all the things, uh, and we'll end the, we'll end the podcast as I always like to do, with, uh, with with just a little just a little saying that I like to say at uh, at the end of my sessions of gaming for D and D, MTG, really anything, mm-hmm. really anything at all, and that is let's plane shift out of this bullet bukkake. <laughs>